Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Kwe, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. So I'm Daniel Bélan, the director of uh, MISC, the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, which is the Center for Canadian, Quebec, and Indigenous Studies at McGill University. MISC supports a multidisciplinary approach to the study of Canada by bringing together students, researchers, and practitioners to discuss important issues about the country's past, present, and future. In addition to our academic programs, uh, we uh, also host public events, such as the wonderful talk that we have today, um, really talks on, on uh, a wide range of topics that are important to Canadians. Our speaker today is uh, Benjamin Hoy, an assistant professor of history at the University of Saskatchewan, where he directs the history GIS lab. Uh, his new book, A Line of Blood and Dirt, Creating the Canada-United States Border Across Indigenous Lands, focuses on Indigenous history and state power and argues that the border was never particularly effective at physically stopping people at the line. He draws from hundreds of oral historians, regional histories, letters, and government archival documents across a wide array of communities and racial ethnic groups and uses mapping and digital history techniques to create a, a visual depiction of Canadian and American power that shifts by region and over time. So we are really, really happy to have Professor Hoy uh, with us today, especially because this talk coincides with the first week of National Indigenous History Month. Professor Oy, thank you again for accepting our invitation. It's all yours. Wonderful. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be here today um, talking about borders and, and our place in the world in, in many respects. Um, so my talk today is going to be on how you create a border and how, in fact, you create a border on lands you do not control and on lands where sovereign nations uh, remain important for many, many years. I, I wanted to quickly begin by, by thanking all of the people who make this kind of research possible. Uh, that includes organizations like the Innovation, uh, Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Harry Guggenheim Foundation, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, but also the teams. Uh, you know, I think often his, historical work is thought of as sort of this lonely endeavor, but in reality, there are dozens of people who make the kind of research that I'm going to show you today possible. And so I wanted to take a moment to, to recognize and thank all of the people whose efforts uh, made what I'm going to show you today a reality. And finally, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Treaty 6 people on whose lands I'm going to be giving my talk and whose lands I now reside on, as well as to the many people whose, whose borders, whether still noted on maps or not, that I had to cross in order to conduct my work. Now in the 1830s, a Milwaukee postal worker who's referenced in the oral histories only as Bailey, set out to deliver mail along a route between Hudson, uh, which is located just uh, on the right side of the map, He's connecting that postal network to St. Paul, Minnesota, located on the other side of the St. Croix River. The trip, as you can imagine, took him across this river on a regular basis before he could connect back on his regular path. Although he didn't realize it at the time, he'd actually crossed an important territorial boundary. For the Anishinaabe and the Sidasakwan, who you may know um, more commonly as the Sioux, the land between the St. Croix River and the Mississippi River served as an important buffer zone. Each community hunted in the area, but neither felt safe enough to take residents up in this boundary or buffer zone. Although Bailey had made this trip many times across his life, today would be different. The Anishinaabe had recently won a battle near Stillwater, Minnesota, and had driven off a party of Acetosacoan. As they were scouting for combatants, the Anishinaabe ran into Bailey and they took him captive. Now with Bailey in tow, they make camp and began to feast on a deer. To Bailey's surprise, his captors treated him very well. 
Their only concern seemed to be that he might alert the Asiri Sakawan to their position. And as the Anishinaabe slept, Bailey made his escape. Days later, he found out that a party of Sioux had regrouped, gathered more recruits, and re-engaged. They killed all the Anishinaabe they came across, Bailey, of course, being spared. Now, Bailey's experience was not typical, but it does point to an important set of assumptions and understandings about the world. Indigenous territories and boundaries were all around Bailey, but like many of his compatriots, he did not understand them well. In fact, he'd stumbled across them on his daily mail route. He was far more familiar with a new kind of territorial order that was being built across North America, one which prioritized European understandings of land, of property, and of belonging. The story I'm going to tell you today is about these kinds of misunderstandings. It's about the growth of new nations, nations that are built on top of nations that came before it. And while there's hundreds of different facets that we could talk about, many of which I explore in more depth in my book, I wanna focus on two of them today. How do nations build borders that would define their reaches? And what does it mean to build borders across indigenous lands? And two, once you've built these borders, how do you define who has a right to belong and under what circumstances and what implications does that have for us in the long term? You can see a picture here of um, a sort of mural sort of reminding us how much of our, our world is built, in fact, on, on native lands. And this is a, a piece that, that is in Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, in 1867, Canada set out to forge a new nation. And as strange as this might sound, a hundred years later, that process was still incomplete. Although we just recently celebrated Canada's 150th anniversary not too long ago, trying to pin down a precise moment when our country emerged is honestly far from simple. Do you base a country's birth on a declaration of independence or on the solidification of its borders or the emergence of a new sense of national identity or on a military campaign? Now, in reality, for Canada, as well for, as for nations across the world, these dates almost never line up. And to give you a sense of how comical this looks like, I, I want to sort of suggest a few dates where Canada could have been born. Now, if it's military that you care about, perhaps a date like 1906, the, day, uh, the, the year that Britain withdrew its few remaining garrisons from Halifax and Esquimalt, is the birth of Canada's sort of military independence. Or maybe you'd look to World War I when a new kind of military independence emerges. Or perhaps World War II when Canada enters a war as a country of its own rather than a colony. Or perhaps you could pinpoint Canada's emergence as an independent nation by its recognition as such on the world stage. By 1909, Canada had created its own Department of External Affairs. It would receive a spot on the League of Nations in 1919. It would sign its first independent treaty in 1923. It would establish independent diplomatic connections with the United States in 1927, and it would gain legislative independence from Britain in 1931. In practice, any of these days could work. Or perhaps the core of a nation is a strong federal government or the declaration of a new kind of citizenship. If so, 1947 seems like a contender when Canada separates its citizenship from Britain that year. Or if formal independence is what matters, then 1982 might do the trick when Canada is wholly independent for the first time and allows it to alter its constitution without British approval. Or perhaps to put all of this a bit more clearly, from 1867 until 1982, more than 100 years had passed and Canada was still going through the process of gaining its independence. Nations emerged, they grew old, and they died in the time that it took between Canada's first push towards independence and the final markers of that culmination. Now, what's so interesting about this kind of thought experiment to try and pick a moment of a country's birth is that the practice often obscures more than it illuminates. 
what's, what's missing from all of these moments is that Canada's birth was not an act simply of creation. That would require empty land. And as the map of indigenous territorial boundaries nicely conveys on the right, empty land was in short supply. Instead, the act of Canada's birth required a simultaneous process of erasure, erasure of indigenous lands, customs, and history. Creating a border was at the very center of this process. Now, creating a border for all of its importance is a really slow and expensive process. And to give you a sense of what this actually looks like, you know, just a small section of border from the Pacific coast to the Rocky Mountains, present day sort of British Columbia and Washington state, just that very small section cost $400,000 in wages and $200,000 in supplies. And that's in 19, uh, 19th century dollars. Maybe a, a marker that would make more sense to you today is it took more than 120,000 days of labor uh, from the start of the process until the end. And that probably doesn't capture everyone involved. The cargo manifest provides you an even better sense of the scale. The surveyors required tens of thousands of feet of lumber, thousands of pounds of sugar, and an endless array of technical equipment like the Zenith telescope pictured here. All of this had to be transported across the better part of a continent. To make matters worse, simply surveying a border is only part of the work. In heavily forested areas, cutting trees was necessary to mark the border. You could, you could put a monument down to mark it, but you can imagine if you're in the middle of a forest, you'll never find it. And so you had to cut what are called uh, tree cuts or slash marks. Um, and you have a picture of that right here. Now along the Pacific coast and the main New Brunswick border area, this is absolutely backbreaking work. At times it took 10 men to cut a quarter mile of boundary a day Dozens of additional laborers are, are required to carry supplies on their backs to the cut teams who are located sometimes 40 miles away from camp. This work is so hard and so uh, painful that most of the men who choose to engage in this kind of work uh, will refuse to return as soon as they're able. They'll make one trip and then, and then that's it. Steep mountains, dense forests, and persistent rain, tedious marches, and unexpected dangers. The surveyors began to refer to mosquitoes as, quote, our tormentors, who took advantage of the men's helplessness as they crossed all of this difficult terrain. In the prairies, bad roads, long supply chains, cold winters, blistering summers, and swarms of mosquitoes made this trek, this, this process, even less appealing. The conditions on these surveys were so harsh that surveyors complained that their task included traversing areas, quote, destitute of all supplies, accepting uncertain provisions of fodder, of fuel, of drinkable water, and of game. So the logistics of finding laborers and outfitting them and keeping them in the field is, is a monumental task, especially along an entire continent. But in reality, only, well, that's only about half the battle. The initial surveyors by the very nature of their work knew nothing about the land they were encountering. They had very, very expensive technical equipment, which is great at finding things like lines of latitude and longitude, but it was completely worthless at finding sources of drinkable water or navigable routes down rivers. That is, in many cases, they're simply lost. Although we don't talk about it much today, none of these boundary surveys, the sort of the basic building blocks of a nation were possible without the support of the indigenous communities they passed through. On maybe the most simple, the most simplest of levels, the Cree, the Osiris Sakowin, the Coast Salish and many others had the power to simply kill or drive off their surveyors at a moment's notice, effectively ending the process in its infancy. On some of the surveys, the US government would provide a military escort, sometimes as many as 200 uh, men. But these soldiers are spread thin. They're in foreign lands and they're not equipped to fight any sort of intense engagements. 
For the British surveyors who brought no military escorts at all, the danger is even more pronounced. Now what's very interesting and I think telling is for the most part, indigenous communities would forgive the trespasses of surveyors, prioritizing the importance of being a good host rather than ruthlessly enforcing their territorial boundaries. In many ways, we live with that legacy today. But the importance of indigenous people to building the nations that we have inherited goes even further. Had indigenous communities simply allowed the surveyors to move unhindered through their lands, but provided nothing else, these surveys would have failed or faced critical delays. In practice, indigenous people possessed four critical resources that the surveyors required. They required knowledge, transportation, supplies, and labor. Now supplies and labor are the most straightforward to understand, right? You can imagine that carting uh, heavy goods across an entire continent is prohibitively expensive and brutal. You know, if you run out of a supply and you're having to pull um, goods from Montreal or Toronto, right? And you're in the prairies, right? That might take months for them to arrive. That's a, that's a real logistical challenge. So surveyors turn to local indigenous people for support. On the Pacific coast, the Stalo, the Semiamu, the Lummi, the Nooksack, and the Colville will provide surveyors with a, a, a bounty of supplies, things like saddles and canoes, sleighs and planks of wood, as well as a wide variety of food. They would also pilot steamers. They'd ferry the parties down the Chilliwack River. They'd care for animals. They rented out their cabins and they served as guides. In the prairies, Métis scouts would carry messages between the astro astronomical stations and served as key diplomats to ease tension with surrounding communities who the surveyors would move through. For the Coast Salish who carried packs of 60 pounds up the sides of mountains, they made the surveying of some of these landmarks possible. Nooksack men for their part would build canoes in the fields, saving surveyors the need to uh, portage massive canoes through dense and difficult to pass through terrain. Simply the ability to build canoes as you needed them was a vital resource. Now what's telling I think about all of this is indigenous people are so important to these boundary surveys that the surveyors themselves will change how they approach hiring and labor to meet the needs of the indigenous communities they encounter. The Ojibwa, for example, would insist on bartering for food and pay on a daily basis rather than accepting a set amount for the duration of their employment to the constant frustration of the surveyors. Other groups would refuse to work unless the boundary survey team cared for their families in their absence. To appease these demands, British survey teams allowed over a dozen families to set up their lodges near an observation camp and would supply them with flour and bacon. So important was it that the survey teams did all kinds of things like this that they were uncomfortable with because they knew that the alternative was often failure. Now, if labor and supplies are key resources to these boundary survey teams, indigenous knowledge was a resource that neither British nor American teams could do without. And there's a number of sort of comical stories about this. But maybe I think uh, one of the, uh, the key topographers maybe explains this best. Uh, so Henry Custer is uh, one of the key topographers who's on uh, one of the boundary teams on the Pacific coast. And he writes that if he'd been forced to use white settlers as guides, it's the survey team would have been met with endless delays. Settlers were unused to travel in these woods and were sure, and I quote, to select always the most awkward place of the route. So while boundary surveyors didn't bother to consistently record the names or tribes of the indigenous laborers, guides, or packers, and navigators that they relied on, they did not hesitate to recognize their vice success. By the time Custer had planned his trip along the Wacom Trail, he'd employed indigenous guides and laborers for several months. He expressed his gratitude for their efforts, emphasizing, quote, the almost incredible amounts of labor that may be gotten of them when he treated them with respect. The Coast Salish had offered laborers to the boundary teams in good faith. Colonial officials, however, rarely lived up to the expectations the Coast Salish would place on them in return. 
Neither Britain, Canada, nor the United States would consult any of these communities into designing the border, and they showed very little interest in their thoughts or their beliefs after the surveys were complete. With that said, Indigenous people continued to find their way throughout all of these different uh, moments. Even after the boundary is created, neither Canada nor the United States had the power to enforce their border in sort of a practical sense, right? You can imagine just placing piles of stone down, spread a couple miles apart, do very little to, to convince people that a border exists. In practice, indigenous knowledge and labor continued to support the border's operation years and sometimes decades after its initial creation. In the 1870s and 1880s, for example, Cree laborers built the stockades that the Northwest Mounted Police would use. Indigenous scouts would track belligerents who tried to flee across the border, including sometimes comically enough, were used to police the police. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the Northwest Mounted Police um, it, it's not a job you wanted in the 19th century. It's, uh, it's cold, it's lonely, um, it pays poorly, you're undersupplied. Some of the people who are living in Saskatchewan don't even have proper hats. They're getting rheumatism and asthma and all of these other these issues. And so many of the men desert. And you have a problem where do you send their friends to go get them? And their friends are like, oh, I, I, I didn't find them, right? And so in practice, indigenous scouts are used often to bring these men home before they can reach the border and flee across it. The Kainai, Métis, and Sioux would gather animals on the wrong side of the border and in practice worked as de facto border guards although none of the people who employed them would ever recognize them as such. During acute moments of violence, indigenous soldiers and scouts would help defend the edges of nations, uh, both in Canada and the United States. More than 300 Haudenosaunee from uh, Grand River and Kanawake, Kanawake assisted Britain in capturing transnational militants who would attack uh, across the border during the 1837 and 1838 rebellion. They would often patrol the swamps on either side of the Grand River, searching for rebels and caches of arms. By the end of the 19th century, much had changed. The border in many regions had been uh, demarcated, so stones had been placed on the ground, and both countries increasingly were attempting to patrol it, which is one of the maps that you see here. This is a map of the Northwest Mounted Police patrol routes in 1885 and 1886, and you can see that they're moving very heavily along the Canada-US border, but they're actually guarding two sets of borders. One is the international border with the United States to the south, but just as importantly, they're patrolling the borders with sovereign indigenous nations, uh, demarcated in white on this map with reserve boundaries. So much had changed. Immigration and disease had begun to remake the landscape of North America. Soldiers, Indian agents, and police officers would soon do the rest. Indigenous people who had helped create the Canada-US border found themselves contending with a new kind of social and new kind of political order. This new order was not something that these communities had consented to, and in many cases, it was not something they desired. As the web of government spread across the country, both Canada and the United States moved past simply creating borders and defending them, and soon began to make pronouncements about who belonged. Now, answering these questions required, uh, required defining who constitutes a family and who would be recognized as a citizen. And neither of these questions is, in practice, a simple matter. Defining belonging required coming up with a way to contend with the fact that the world was still in motion and still today is in motion. Throughout the 19th century, indigenous workers, much like their European counterparts, would ignore the implications of the Canada-US border as much as possible. The border would become more and more significant, but it never would stop movement outright. Men from Grand Portage Band in Wisconsin would chop wood and mine precious metals in Canada. Ojibwe from Garden River, Ontario, would make a considerable portion of their income selling berries in the United States. The Haudenosaunee from St. Regis, Kaunagua, the Lake of Two Mountains would cross the border to sell patent medicine, baskets, beadwork, snowshoes, as well as to work as laborers, shantymen, steamship operators, and bridge builders. That is, on a, on a practical level, 
migration always seemed to undermine the national boundaries that Canada had spent so much time and effort trying to create. Separating who was Canadian from who was American was a daunting task. In 1860, Canada repre Canadians represented about 14 to 15 percent of the of Detroit's foreign-born population, and by 1880, they represented 23 and a half percent. In the 1870s, 14 percent of Canada's population lived in the United States at any given time, and border inspection simply couldn't keep up. In the 1880s, Michigan didn't even bother trying to trace the number of people crossing the border because it contended that the practice was simply impossible. They never had the resources to monitor that kind of movement. So faced with chronic shortages of personnel, Canada and the United States instead would focus their attention less on border guards, which were woefully lacking across the entire continent, and instead focus their attention on the family and on the home. Now for Americans, the home served as the basic building block of society. Belonging to them required civilization and civilization in turn required a home. Presidents, suffragists, entertainers and vigilantes all found this idea appealing. Defense of the home would justify hundreds of pieces of legislation from the Dawes Allotment Act, which targeted the communal ways that indigenous people lived to the Morrill Act, which targeted Mormon polygamy. Now in practice, like most powerful concepts throughout history, the home did not have a natural or stable definition. By some definitions, the home consisted of women whose beauty, whose smiles, whose kindnesses softened life's trials and provided a necessary complement. In this imagination, the home had little need for masculine women or for feckless men. But for many Americans who were growing up in the, in the 1860s, the basic features of the home seemed at odds with one another after the Civil War. If African-American men could vote and become citizens, what about white women? All social relations suddenly seemed up for renegotiation. In that context, who people married, who could vote, and how individuals defined their allegiance appeared to be more and more important. And this is at a turning point for both Canada and the United States. Canada emerging as a new nation in 1867 and the United States reestablishing itself following a devastating civil war. This cartoon gives you a sense, a taste of the ways that everyday people sometimes visualize this fear of a disappearing home. It begins by asking what breaks up the home and it responds with an image of an un unemployed man, bad employment for women and children and a turn to prostitution in the final frame. While constitutional amendments would clarify the, the legal status of African-Americans the status of indigenous people through all of this remained in flux. The nationwide enfranchisement of indigenous people would not occur until 1924 in the United States and until 1960 in Canada. In the interim, both countries developed a very convoluted set of half measures, creating an endless mess and an endless amount of confusion. Michigan, for example, in 1850, would grant suffrage to quote, every civilized male inhabitant of Indian descent, a native of the United States, not a member of any tribe. But Michigan had created tribes for the purposes of land session and by 1855 had dissolved them again in a legal sense because they'd been inconvenient. Now the Anishinaabe didn't care. They'd never organized their communities in the way that Michigan had desired and they would continue to live their lives much as they had after um, the tribes had been abolished. The legal sleight of hand, however, would inadvertently give the Anishinaabe in Michigan the right to vote. And to many politicians at the time, this seemed like a horrifying change. Pearly Bill would demand that Indigenous people either remain Indian or fully white. From Bill's perspective, there existed no opportunity for dual citizenship or overlapping senses of belonging. He was, of course, talking about a world filled with overlapping belongings, a world built, and today even still is a world in motion. Political cartoons like this one give you a competing vision. In the background are a pile of uh, uh, sort of racial stereotypes 
depicting undesirable immigrants who are voting at the poll, while in the foreground, an indigenous man is prevented from doing so. The caption reads, move on. Has the Native American no right that the naturalized American is bound to respect? For all the fears that politicians like Bills expressed, indigenous people in Canada showed little interest in adopting European conceptions of citizenship or belonging. An indigenous resistance to suffrage, that is the right to vote and to citizenship would baffle federal administrators for decades, especially in the United States. During the Civil War and Reconstruction, African-Americans had fought and died for equality, hedging their bets on citizenship and the right to vote. Indigenous people would follow a different path, emphasizing their rights as independent nations. The lack of interest in what Canada and the United States offered, however, did not prevent hundreds of communities from suffering as both countries defined who could belong and under what circumstances. Botched attempts to assimilate indigenous people through private property resulted in half of all indigenous land holding in the United States disappearing under the Dawes Act. If you were to add all of that land together, you could fill Nevada. You'd still have room to fill Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island. Now, pronouncements like this often had fatal consequences. American beliefs, for example, that Little Bear's people who are pictured here belonged in Canada, not the United States, would cause the Cree to suffer three decades of starvation and dislocation before the American government allowed them to make their home in the Rocky Boy Reservation in 1916. And nor were indigenous people the only one who faced hardship under this new regime. In 1855, Congress ruled that women's citizenship would follow the citizenship of her husband. In doing so, they entrenched marriage as a crucial mechanism through which citizenship traveled. That process often operated like a cudgel. Laws like this one and the ones that would follow allowed government officials to strip women of their citizenship should they choose to marry undesirable men. Canada would use marriage and the homes it created as a similar underpinning for belonging. Taxes on Chinese immigration, for example, created gender ratios of 28 men to one women. Miscegenation laws, taxes and stigma aimed at Chinese women, uh, attempting to prevent them from immigrating, as well as Chinese men from uh, preventing them, in many cases from marrying outside of their community were aimed at preventing Chinese immigrants from making homes in North America. Weird laws around belonging and citizenship would define who could immigrate, who could vote, and who could reside on a reservation, as well as those facing deportation, like Little Bear's people will. Although we often think about who, can, who a Canadian or American is as following some kind of logic or shaped by some kind of master plan, the reality was far more complex and far less certain. There's nothing natural or certain about nationality. It's not etched on your skin and it certainly can't be determined at a glance. We build our own borders and we define who fits within them. In many cases, the framework we still follow was built by individuals who lived more than a hundred years ago. They often had weird understandings of the world and we still live in the shadows of their work. I'd like to share maybe one final story with you to help drive all of this home. In 1890, the Marysville uh, Evening Bulletin in, of Kentucky offered its readers a surefire way of telling Canadians apart from Americans, something customs and immigration agents even today struggle with. It noted, quote, that it is only American ears that get frostbitten in Canada. The ears of the natives are in, inured against excessive cold. So the next time you're walking through the Canadian winters without a hat, pay attention to the ears. You may well just have caught a glimpse into the history of belonging and the thousands of ways that humans have tried to make sense of the world around them. Thank you. <laughs>